Shortly after I moved to New York to go to college, I went home for Thanksgiving with my family. I sprawled on my parents' bed that morning doing the New York Times crossword puzzle as the Macy's Parade played on TV, grateful to see my overwhelming new city reduced to the dimensions of a television screen. Dad read the newspaper in the armchair beside the bed while Mom was in the bathroom getting dressed. I almost gave up on that Thursday's difficult crossword puzzle when Dad, another crossword puzzle, another crossword buff, asked if I needed help. Thanks, I said, adding rhetorically, of course, but who would know the Turkish word for mourning? Saba, he said. I wrote the letters in the squares. In some foggy corner of my brain, I remembered hearing that Dad had lived in Turkey as a child, although I could not have said at what age or in what circumstances. For whatever reason, perhaps modesty, perhaps the habit of silence that grows in people who spend many years away from those with whom they shared early experiences, my father had never talked much about growing up in Syria or living in Turkey or spending the war years in China before coming to America. What I knew about his life I had gleaned in disconnected bits, and I assumed I knew more or less how they fit together. Then one Thanksgiving morning, he tossed me the Turkish word for mourning, and I wondered, how much more don't I know about this man, my father? On my next visit to my parents' house in Maryland, I sat down with my father in his basement office, the former guest bedroom where my siblings and I had had sleepovers and parties as kids. I came with a mini recorder and a list of questions. Dad, in his early 70s then, sat behind his big desk, surrounded by photos of his children and grandchildren. On the wall behind him hung pictures of his brothers and himself at family weddings and bar mitzvahs, smartly dressed men with high broad foreheads and wide confident smiles. I remember dad's first tentative words as I hit the start button. This is the life story of me, Mike Sutton. The Zionist movement coincided with increasing Arab resentment that European promises of independence had been false, which they abruptly realized when France and England parceled the Middle East into their own colonial protectorates. As Arabs began to see that a Jewish homeland in Palestine might be more than a pipe dream, their resistance grew. Anger over the rising plausibility of a Jewish state in an Arab realm led to ongoing riots in Palestine in the 1920s and 30s and heightened anti-Semitism in neighboring countries. Then in 1939, Germany invaded Poland, launching the beginning of World War II. My father was on vacation at the time with several friends in the mountains of Lebanon. Everyone rushed home, as he recalled, piling into train cars like cattle. Knowing some of what the Nazis had been doing to Jews in Germany, they could imagine the terrible changes that might come. Though they were a thousand miles from the war zone in Europe, that distance might not mean much in territories under European control. It was a time of tremendous uncertainty and displacement worldwide. My grandfather had sensed the growing need to get the family out of Syria for some time. Anti-Semitism in their daily lives had not become much more overt, at least not so ob obvious or w so witnessed, my father said. It's just that you sort of knew it was coming because the Arabs were beginning to ask for independence, to have the French leave Syria. And you knew once they did, well, we did not know as children, but the grown-ups knew that eventually if they took control of the country, it would be a different country completely. Late in 1940, midway through the school year, my, fa my grandfather came to his two oldest sons, both teenagers, with a few words that would change the lives of my father and his brother forever. You are going to China to your Uncle Joe, he said. You will go work with him. The decision was announced, not open for discussion. Their father had arranged for the boys to work for his brother Joe's Shanghai business of exporting hand-embroidered Chinese linens to the United States. My father prepared to leave not with a sense of sadness or foreboding, nor of foreshadowing that this would be the last time he would see Aleppo, but of anticipation. For young men, it was like an adventure, he said. It was exciting when you're a teenager and you're going overseas, especially to someone who is related. After all, they had watched many young men go abroad, returning a few years later with piles of money and stories to tell. Friends and family joined to see them off as they walked a few blocks from their house to the railroad station. Salim Sutton and his sons set off together from Aleppo to Jerusalem in what was then British-controlled Palestine. They spent a few days visiting family there before connecting with a train to Egypt. Then, somewhere between Jerusalem and Egypt, the conductor passed through the train car, checking tickets and identification papers. You don't have the proper papers to go to Egypt, he declared. What do you mean, my grandfather replied. It's all there. No, my father recalled the conductor saying. You're lacking this or that. 
It was at that point, my father said, that we felt anti-Semitism asserting itself. The conductor had noted in their papers that they were Jewish and without further explanation pulled the brake cord and stopped the train in the middle of the desert, ordering my grandfather and his sons to get off. They picked up their luggage and disembarked between stations in a tiny village near the Egyptian border. My grandfather inquired and found a driver to help them cross into Egypt and get to Port Said. But before long a sandstorm kicked up and the road disappeared under the blowing sand. The driver would go a short way and the car would get stuck in the sand. He would back up, try again, and get stuck again. Finally, Dad said, we figured we would have to spend the night there. We were the only Jews in that whole village, I'm sure. There were no Jews at that time in that part of the world. But somehow, I don't know how, my father found somebody who could put us up for the night. They were really nice. We slept on mattresses on the floor, and the next morning we got another cab. By that time, the road had cleared, the sun was shining, and we got in the car and went into Egypt with no hassle, nothing, just crossed over. Arriving at Port Said, they discovered that their ship to Shanghai would not sail for another two weeks. Since my grandfather would not stay, could not stay away from his business that long, he left his sons in a room at a small Port Said hotel and returned to Syria. For Dad and Saleh, it was two weeks in which they never strayed far from their little room. You know, my father said, you take one step and you never know that it's going to be a final step. I didn't know that I wouldn't see my father again. We figured after he saw us get to the United States, he would be able to come with the rest of the family. I don't know if things would have been different had we known that there was going to be war between Japan and China and that we would be in the middle of it. Everyone you met was enjoying life in Shanghai to the fullest, Dad recalled of his first months in the new city in the spring of 1941, never dreaming that a few months later everything would change with Japan's entry into the war. Shanghai bustled with commerce and revelry, seemingly impervious to the conflicts intensifying around the world. By summer, however, signs of war were inescapable. Dad's Uncle Joe got his first serious indication that China might soon be involved on a business trip to Japan in August when he realized that Japanese authorities had ransacked his luggage in his hotel room to see if he was a spy. He knew that as an American citizen, he would be considered an enemy if Japan and the U.S. ended up being at war. Japan already had troops in Shanghai, though it didn't govern the city, after invading much of eastern China in 1937. In the summer of 1941, Americans began vacating the Hongku district where they had lived because they feared U.S. involvement in the war and, Jap and Japanese troops took their place. The Americans anticipated that war was coming and wanted not to stay there and be subjected to Japanese occupation, Dad explained. That left a vacuum and the Japanese came in and filled that vacuum. Joe packed his belongings and booked passage on what turned out to be the last passenger ship to the United States until the war was over, leaving my father alone in Shanghai. The young man whose father had deliberately steered him away from his textile business in Aleppo found himself across the world from his family, working in the linen exporting business and living in a little room at the YMCA. Realizing that I was not capable of taking care of the whole business myself, my uncle kept on a manager, Dad explained the Syrian man who had run the Shanghai business when my father's uncle was out of the country. Still, much of the responsibility fell on my father, who felt compelled to learn what the business required as quickly as he could, although, as he said, of course, I was still a young kid. For the next few months, he continued working in the office with the manager, communicating regularly with his father and grandfather by mail. He recalled with great the great trepidation he felt after the Americans pulled out from Shanghai knowing that the Japanese were allied with the Germans and that there was no way to foretell what they would do in Shanghai if the city became involved in the war. There was nothing to do but wait. One Sunday afternoon in early December, after an evening out with friends, my father returned to his room at the YMCA and was startled by an uproar in the harbor. Late that Sunday night, he said, maybe already early Monday morning, I heard a great commotion, the sound of bombing and shooting. I got up, put on my top coat, and went out to the roof together with several other people in the YMCA. We saw fire and smoke in the distance by the harbor. From the roof they witnessed the very first moments that the war reached China. Earlier that day, December 7, 1941, my father had heard on his shortwave radio that the Japanese had bombed the U.S. Naval Fleet in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, outside Honolulu. The Americans and British, American and British soldiers had vacated Shanghai, he said, leaving only a small force to guard the embassies. 
In Shanghai Harbor, there were two small warships, one British and one American. When the bombing of Pearl Harbor took place, the Japanese forces in Shanghai demanded that the British and Americans surrender their boats. The Americans surrendered right away, realizing that there was no sense in fighting the Japanese army with just a handful of Marines. They were all taken prisoner. The British did not want to surrender, and the Japanese hit the ship and took it anyway. People up on the YMCA roof witnessed this bombing and gunfire in the harbor in the middle of the night. The next morning, they watched from office windows as the Japanese army marched across the bridge to the main commercial areas. Shanghai was thus occupied by the Japanese from the first day of the war in the Pacific. The routines my father had established, working for the business while keeping in long distance contact with his uncle in New York and family in Aleppo, came to an abrupt halt. As soon as the war broke out, he said, everything stopped completely. No more exporting. No ships were allowed to leave because Japan and the United States were at war. Everyone had to fend for himself and make his own living. In less than a year, he had gone from living at home and attending school to living on his own across the world in a country at war. But if anything matures you, he said, it's being on your own to fend for yourself with nobody to rely on for anything. That's when your resources become the surviving factor. At the back of your mind, you know that it doesn't help to feel one way or the other about it because there's no ship, there's no train, there's nothing that can take you back to your family. In Aleppo, my father's family moved back into their home six months after the riots, but life did not return to normal. Tension between Muslims and Jews was increasing, and my grandfather's health had taken a turn for the worse. In late 1949, he went to a doctor, something one did only in extreme circumstances, because of increasingly severe headaches and diminishing vision. The doctor diagnosed the early stages of a brain tumor. Medical options were rudimentary in Aleppo, so the doctor suggested that my grandfather go to Beirut for treatment not available in Syria. This would have been easy just two years before, but after the establishment of Israel in May 1948, trains and buses continued to pass from Syria to Lebanon, but the Jewish government forbade Jews to leave the country, except in rare circumstances. Jews might be granted temporary travel permits for medical emergencies, but only with payment of a substantial sum to be reimbursed when the travelers returned, and only if some family members stayed behind in Syria. So the family had to choose who would accompany my grandparents and who would stay behind. Joe, 15 years old, was chosen to escort his father and mother. When I went to Beirut, Joe said, I didn't think I'm not coming back. We were facing the events that were happening at the time. I felt that I was leaving to help dad get better and I would do what I needed to do for the business. It was not with the intention of not coming back. Life wasn't life-threatening in Syria. Perhaps we would even return to Syria and continue the business if we could. For the rest of the family though, the prohibition against Jewish emigration from Syria posed no small obstacle. Jews who were caught trying to leave faced the death penalty or prison with hard labor. Thousands left through clandestine channels nonetheless, trafficked out individually or in small groups by hired smugglers to escape the escalating oppression. There were those who knew how to do it, Joe explained, because the restriction against emigration was only on Jews. They camouflaged you as an Arab and put you on a train or bus from Aleppo to Beirut and you got out. For my grandfather in Beirut, there was no improvement after several months at the American University Hospital, and his doctor suggested that he go to Israel for better options. There was just one problem. Lebanon did not recognize the new country of Israel and would not let anyone across the border. But as Joe explained, the relationship between Israel and Lebanon was not openly good, but it was undercover good. Word circulated among Jews that they could board a ship at night in Beirut and be received in the morning by officials at the Israeli coast. Israeli officials would not have allowed Muslims to enter this way, Joe explained, but Jews were welcomed to build up the new country. Ralph was the last to leave Aleppo in 1952 after Joe, Margot, and their father had already gone to Israel. He recounted his passage across the border from Syria into Lebanon alone, camouflaged in Arab clothing. He had paid a train conductor to take him to Tripoli disguised as his son. If the border authorities asked questions, the conductor was ready to say, this is my son, he gets good marks, and he wants to go to a better school in Lebanon. So I'm taking him to Beirut. He had urged Ralph to pretend to be asleep if this happened and let him answer all the questions, since Ralph's accent would give him away as Jewish. Sure enough, when the train inspector came through at 2 a.m., Ralph heard the conductor say, he's my son, he's asleep. 
closed his eyes as tightly as he could until he heard the conductor pass. In Tripoli, he deboarded the train and caught a bus to, to Beirut. God does things for a reason, my late Aunt Sandra said, hearing her husband Ralph describe the journey. Me? I'm scared at my own shadow. He traveled out of the country as a child. <laughs>